Hi everybody, welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. We're back with some new episodes. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And I'm Jake Fisher. First thing we're going to talk about, Tesla. Tesla manages to always be in the news, but in the last two weeks they've made some quite influential news. Two big words, battery swap. Battery swap, and that's a great idea. And with all due respect to supercharging, which is the 30 minutes to half uh, capacity, that is 20 minutes, and uh, it's, it's not a minute and a half f refueling. Battery swap, on the other hand, is quick, in and out, you're off, you off you go with a new battery. I mean, is this a game changer? Well, I think it is. I mean, you talk about better place, and you know, the, the idea of battery swapping, I mean, whether or not Better Place came up with it or in the RC cars that I played with as a kid. I mean, I did battery swapping. I had one charging when I was putting the other one in. So it's kind of like a no-brainer. Now, what, what, what some other people have talked about doing is kind of having one battery for everybody. And they go and they swap in. Your, you go in with your Leaf and you go in with your Volt or whatever you got. And you change the battery. What Tesla's doing is they're owning the whole process, right? So, I mean, they're putting up these. They've already, you know, talk about news, right? So they're talking about putting in stations across the country where you could go and get your 20 minute charge on. But if they could use these stations to swap a dedicated Tesla battery. And Tesla, you, as we know, we, they, they want to do the dedicated battery because they're building their car around that battery. So they don't want to Sure, the, mod the Model X will have the same battery as the Model S. And right, right. They don't want to. third gen might too. Yeah, I mean, they told they, me from the start that the, the car is built for battery swaps, but they'd be loath to let any third party really right. touch their battery and, and get <clears> any <throat> sort of glean any secrets to the battery. <laughs> right, right. Uh, unlike my, my Tamiya R RC car, <laughs> it's not the same battery. It's their own thing. And um, if they could do that, yeah, that is a game changer because now mean, it's 90, nits, 90 seconds. But, uh, I'm going to be, I am the office doubting Thomas of Tesla. That is which, your role. Which is appropriate because it's my name. There are 125,000 gas stations in America. That despite the fact that you can swap a battery in 90 seconds, you still have to plan your trip. And your trip still has to be along one of these corridors. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's still a reality of uh, electric vehicles. But Tesla is determined to either minimize or remove completely uh, some of these barriers. And who knows what the next surprise might be. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give that to Elon Musk. He is trying so hard to, to make this viable. I mean, e when you set up your own stations, I can only imagine the bureaucratic nightmare of trying to get one of these stations at, at a, a rest area. But and then the cost and the well, licensing. Well, it's $500,000, they said, just to make the, the technology to swap the battery. But I do have to say something. I have to defend the Audi A8. That's the car they used in that video as the typical gasoline-powered car. It took three minutes to refuel that versus 90 seconds for the Tesla. But to be fair, an Audi A8 has a 24-gallon gas tank. Uh, it nearly it's good for 500 miles. It's good of range for 600, 600 miles. That's yeah. twice as long as the 300 I get out of a Tesla. And the Audi, when I drive it in the winter, I still get 600 miles. Yeah. The Tesla, what would I get in the winter? 200 instead of 300? Yeah, that's the reality still. But I'm sure that uh, every university in the world and every uh, OEM is working on a battery that uh, is, is gets you 400 mile range and is rechargeable quicker. And uh, who knows what kind of chemistry is we're going to see. No, who knows what will come out next week. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, i, I got to call you out here. I mean, you know, 600-mile range and, and whatever, I mean, that's great if you're taking a long trip. But most of the time, you're not taking a long trip. I mean, I am not a tree hugger. I'm not, all, you know, I'm in the forefront of everyone needs to buy an electric car. But the truth is, is that day in, day out, you're not taking the long 600-mile trips. You're going to work. You're doing your errands. And in that case, if you want to compare your A8 to my Tesla, which I guess I'm keeping our Tesla. I'm going to start driving. I might have to get an A8. <laughs> you better get an no A8. No problem. I'm good for that. <laughs> I don't know why I said my Tesla. Well, anyway. All right. Eventually, we'll have to get rid of our Tesla. And just kind of. No hopefully, rush. No hopefully, rush. That no rush. that won't happen soon. Yeah. Um, but the Tesla, I don't have to go to a gas station every 600 miles because every time you take it home, you put it in your garage, it's charged. So if you really want to talk about a year down the road and how many times you're going to service stations and gas stations or battery swapping stations, Tesla wins. Wow. And the running costs. We haven't oh, no, the, the started running costs talking are about far, that. Far, yeah. far cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah, you might have me on that. I'll, I'll, I'll write, write that down. I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that. More news on the alternative fuel front. Bosch just came out with a study saying that if you buy the diesel version of a car, it's available in diesel and gas, you buy the diesel version, you will save over three to five years, $3,000 to $6,000. 
in price. Even if the diesel option is an $8,000 option like it is in most uh, heavy-duty trucks? I don't know if they did heavy-duty trucks. It was a lot of the European stuff. Uh, that even despite the added cost of fuel, you'll save money, you get more money on resale. Resale might be the thing. Well, yeah, because I mean, yeah. you, you have a jet, a TDI, you've right. got something that's almost gold plated. I mean, I don't know how it's going to be with a cruise diesel because that's an unknown quantity as, as, as of this point. Yeah, but, I mean, but, but even if you look at some of the other diesels that came on the market, they even weren't w well received. I mean, the Liberty diesel, and we weren't big fans, but even those, I mean, there, there's a little cult following. You're going right. After there, there's those. people who want to find those. I mean, to be fair, Bosch, who makes diesel components, well, saying unbiased. diesel is, right. th yeah, th it's like <laughs> the milk board saying you should drink more milk. But that said, I mean, I'm, I'm a big diesel fan, and, and they make sense for a lot of people. Um, you know, I just, I was telling you guys, you know, I just went up to Montreal to watch the F1 with the kids. And, um, in our I cruise diesel. In our cruise diesel. And, um, you know, what's interesting about the diesels is that if you look at the overall fuel economy, you know, they're okay. Um, if you look at, you know, the highway fuel economy, as the EPA uh, that's does. where they shine. Where oh. they really shine is if you look at our data, where we're doing a steady 65 miles per hour, That's they're it. phenomenal. They're unbelievable. I mean, they give it up at the, at the city. But if you're taking a long cruise, and I, I took our cruise diesel, I cruised on along long cruise. on a long cruise, thank <laughs> you very much, going a bit more than posted speed limits. And I got, you know, I'm getting 44 miles per gallon. And that is something that's phenomenal at a, you know, and it's quiet and it's refined. And but it's but a steady you, car. you know what? You know what's driving me nuts? If I buy a Prius plug in, I get a 2,500 hour tax credit. Yes. You know, on a, on a car that was already efficient, I'm making it yeah. more efficient. Or I get nothing on a diesel. You know, I think that's wrong. You know, I, I think it's playing favorites. I think you should be able to get tax credits for buying diesel. You should. And uh, I mean, indeed, in Europe, uh, the, the, the diesel is subsidized. So there is <coughs> a social engineering component to encourage people to choose a uh, <coughs> fuel efficient. Well, here's vehicle. another thing that will get people to buy a fuel efficient vehicle. Driving here this morning, I saw a sign on the Merit. It said it was. A, <coughs> I stopped at a rest stop, and the sign says "reserved for low emitting fuel efficient vehicles." And it was basically the closest spot I could park at to the rest area. There you go. Did they say diesels accepted? You know, but but there's the thing. <laughs> First off, why? Why do we need this? Second, who parks there? Do I park there with my Tahoe Hybrid, which gets 19 <laughs> instead of the normal 14? Do I park there with my Malibu Hybrid that gets, what, 28, 29 versus an Accord that gets 31? Well, I mean, what falls apart here is, you know, I mean, you are talking about the social engineering, but, but it's, it's, and it's, it's kind of choosing horses in this horse race. But the question is, what horse race are we, are we, we running on here? And you talk about, like, the uh, tax credits for hybrids or whatnot and not getting the diesels. I mean, this is all kind of from the EPA. Environmental Protection Agency. We're talking about environment. We're not necessarily right. talking about energy policy or, or reducing, reducing for foreign oil. Thank you. Oh, exactly. There you go. Exactly. So if you want to reduce foreign oil, yeah, diesel, rocking. If you want to talk about pure environment, yeah, you know what? That 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 silly uh, plug-in Prius is going to do better for emissions. Than and we'll, we'll talk about the plug-in a bit later. Uh, <clears throat> let me get to some test results now. Honda. What the hell's with Honda? I mean, we just tested two two of their products, the Acura RLX and the Honda Cross Tour. And both of them were utterly, th they were letdowns. Honda is a lean company. So they concentrate on the mainstream. So they got the Accord right. The, oh, the, the Accord's the, terrific. The, the CRV I'll, I'll that. is right on target. CRV is awesome. But at the bookends with Insight and CRZ, and then you go to the RLX, uh, it's all, it's half-baked and phoned in. Yes. You know what really gets me about the RLX? The Chevy Impala kicks its ass. Oh, completely. Not only a Chevy Impala, but a whole host of, of cars that are large sedans without any luxury nameplate, costing less than $40,000. Not seating one thing to it in terms of uh, driving dynamics or features or anything. And, and what, what happened with the Cross Tour? I mean, we didn't love it before, but it, but it came in for a mid-cycle refresh and... The cross door is just an amalgam of all kinds of cars uh, baked in t to make a car <coughs> that's um, going to be a station wagon, an SUV, and a sedan, and a coupe all at the same time. And it fails on all counts. Well, plus, the changes they made, the steering got a lot worse. The controls got awful. Oh, the controls. Their new radio system. Wh whoever's doing radios at Honda. 
I don't understand this. I mean, American Honda, <coughs> I mean, they're sitting in Southern California, and they have to know that this is the radio that's coming out to their new products. And if it's dictated from Japan, then there's nobody in that whole conference room saying, hey, we can't do that. Hey, this thing sucks. This Maybe thing shouldn't put this not out. happening over my dead body. I mean, Consumer Reports going to kill us on the controls here. And we what's, did. We did. What's going on? I don't know. I, I've got a conspiracy theory about the uh, vehicles like the Cross Tour. And, you know, I, I know we're, we test cars and we're kind of like, you know, a certain section of people, but it's like an Accord wagon. Would be oh, that'd be great. Awesome. What a and foreign concept. Well, you know, and I know, I know you talk to Honda, you talk to these people, like, there's no. A, there's a TSX wagon. There's a TSX wagon, but, but, but again, it's like smaller and more expensive. But I mean, you look at an Accord, Accord's a brilliant vehicle for like, you know, 23 grand. Put a little box back on it, now it's functional. So my conspiracy theory is that if you do actually do that, which people want, well, why do I really want to buy a CRV? Why do I want oh, to buy a yeah. Pilot? And they can make a whole lot more money on a Pilot than they can on an Accord wagon. Absolutely. So if you're going to do it, it's like, okay, we'll make a cross tour and we'll just junk it up enough that it won't really compete <laughs> with anything else that we buy. Next question is, we tested a Prius plug-in. Do you buy a plug-in or not? This is what I said about the Prius plug-in. Um, too little, too late, and for too much money. And that's because, uh, okay, uh, Toyota felt the pressure. I mean, there were, for the previous generation, Prius, th there were a bunch of, uh, of uh, aftermarket conversions to make it a plug-in so it can go electric only for you know some initial 12, 15, 20 miles. And some of them went out of business too. They, yes, they did. <laughs> yeah, because right. I mean, we had our Prius done by A123 A1, and they're, right. they're done. Yeah. So Toyota said, okay, we'll do it ourselves, and here it is. But Toyota is the, the conservative company that they are. They uh, don't want to give you too much electric power. They want to get the uh, <coughs> internal combustion engine kicking in anytime you're a little bit in a hurry. You are uh, seeing a little bit of a hill in the background or, or in the uh, horizon. And, um, and the, and the tem outside temperature is in between like a very narrow window of between about 68, 68 to 72. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just uh, not giving you what I don't. I think that a lot of people are expecting. I want to be electric vehicle, but not have the uh, brain gen anxiety. But does it make sense for anybody? No, no. it doesn't. You know, and I think you, you got it right. It's like, look, Toyota's got this hybrid synergy drive, which has been producing for what 15 years now, and it works really, really well. They've got the Prius. It's incredibly efficient. It's not expensive. It's very practical. Um, why mess with it for in their minds and? Honestly, they're right. The car, it's not putting out a lot of emissions. It's not using a lot of fuel. You go to this extent where now i got to plug it in every night, whatever. It's like the difference is not that big. From a business sense, I mean, here, here's the way to look at it. I mean, you have a clientele ready to buy a Prius plug-in. We can make more money out of it. We'll sell well, you know, to I, those think, I think that's the thing. They're, they're, <coughs> they've got to be making a good chunk of money because, there's, like I said earlier, there's a $2,500 tax credit. Once you take into that account, that's 3000 bucks more. Right. The thing is, I can buy a Chevy Volt now. You know, a friend of mine said, should I buy a Chevy Volt? I can get them for $25,000. A Volt gives you far more electric capability. Or lease a Volt for a $199, is it? Uh, yeah. $269. Okay. But I mean, you can lease plenty of other electrics for $199. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is, is, you just look at the normal Prius. Their Toyota's are incredibly successful with it. Selling, I mean, you look at the sales of it. I mean, there's the demand for it. I mean, it's, it's one of the top selling vehicles in the country. And you look at everyone else who's been doing electric cars or plug in electric cars and all these things, they aren't really, they don't have the market for it. So I think they're kind of sticking with what works. Okay. Uh, going in a different direction, the Jaguar XF. Lovely car to drive. You know, it's funny. Uh, Gabe made a statement in the office saying that, you know, this is, the, I think, the sportiest sedan, sportiest luxury sedan you can buy. Yeah, and I mean, and we're willing to argue. We'll, yeah. we'll argue anything. Sure. And, and well, Jake and I went to argue, and then we came up with a blank. The XF, I mean, interestingly, uh, the XF now beats BMW at its own game. I mean, it steers better. It, it handles better. It's, it's, yeah, it's our, not our, the our highest. Yeah, five series. The five series we tested was depressingly bad steering. Yes, and I think BMW has learned that the hard way. Uh, but the Jaguar is, is a delight to drive. I mean, if you like driving, and we're not saying that it's the best car in terms of, you know, access and controls and, and whatnot. No, it's not. Right. But uh, as a sports luxury sedan, it's, it hits the mark. But would you get that car? Would you buy an XF? No, I wouldn't. I mean, well, 
I'm a little worried about I'm, it. I mean, down, of course, you, you, have, you have your Tesla. <laughs> yeah, I got my Tesla, and I'm keeping that. You're all but, set there. But no, I mean, the point is, is that what people perceive, I think, as good handling vehicles, and what the reality is, is just changing so quickly. So, I mean, the big story in the XF, I don't think, is that the XF is so amazing to drive. It's that what happened to BMW, right? I mean, they lost. They're losing the steering feel. They're losing that control. They're losing that great ride. And, you know, you go over that mindset, it's like, well, BMW, I want to buy that because it handles well. It's like, the new one's not so much. And there are some vehicles that are coming out of left field that are like, you know, I mean, the MKZ. The oh. Lincoln, wait, who, you're, who, you're, who saying, would even, you're saying the Lincoln is fun to drive. I'm saying the Lincoln MKZ is a wonderful steering, great steering, great handling, nice ride, I mean, just really out there. And, and you want to play a debate club, but MKZ versus 5 Series? Ooh, do it a blind test. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, is, is amazingly, I mean, didn't we say that if you closed your eyes, you'd think you were driving an Audi or something? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think that's also what gets me about the XF is that <coughs> I can buy a Passat CC and I get something that's pretty much as enjoyable to drive. It's going to have reliability problems too, so I don't miss out on that with the Jag. Nice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're looking for that. With uh, levels, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, it's very stylish and it's 35 grand. Or I can buy a Buick Regal. You know, I, I, I'm just not Again, sure. Again, perception. Yes. <laughs> well, Buick, 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 Buick. Wait a minute. You're saying a <coughs> Buick and a Lincoln are more fun to drive than a BMW 5 Series. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. Also talking about Buick, we tested the Buick Encore. And it's, 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 a, it's an odd mix of attributes, isn't it? It's surprising how many clowns can fit in it. You know, I mean, really, it's <laughs> roomier than I thought. Because the cozy coupe is too small. I know. So, I know. It does it's look kind of a like a there. caricature of itself. I guess what gets me is... is uh, it's hard, it's mean to say this, but it's putting lipstick on a pig in a way. And they did a better job than that, but, but I mean... Good lipstick. I mean, it's quiet. And yeah, it it's, it's got some good points. I mean, it, it's really <coughs> hard to find a quiet and a comfortable riding small SUV. Yeah. Well, and uh, the Buick Encore is that. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I would put it this way. I think the po product planners got it right. A small SUV that's luxurious, that's quiet, they got it right. The execution is flawed, and part of it is the powertrain. I mean, it's slow, it's a thirsty. A 1.4 liter turbo is not going to do that. It, it's, it's slow and thirsty. It. Right. So, I mean, if, with a decent powertrain and maybe something that didn't look so awkward in execution, but that, you know, and, and Lexus, they're talking about the, the new Oh, that's right. Yeah, they're talking about a Lexus <coughs> NX, which, which, I mean, they've been giving away money there. But a, it, a luxurious a RAV4 would be... It's a no-brainer. It's what everybody wants. And, right. <coughs> you know, we saw, like, the... The RAV6, I like to call it, the, the V6 RAV4, that kind of went away. But, I mean, that was just, you know, we had tested a while ago what was the uh, the, the high mm -hmm. version with the, the leather and everything. It's like that would have been a brilliant Lexus that I think a lot of people Make it a little wanted. quieter, make it ride a little bit better, and it would have mm -hmm. been, would have sure, been great. Sure, sure. Uh, that actually gets us to a reader question. A reader asked us, what crossover do you think is the most comfortable one, but for under $25,000? Oh, that's a... Tall order, but okay. Let's uh, let's start uh, with uh, defining comfort. Uh, let's take a composite of ride comfort and quietness and seat comfort. And I think, uh, I mean, in my book, it, it's probably going to be the Honda CRV because of the ride. What about you? Your thoughts? I think the CRV is a good choice. I think, um, you know, the Forester is a good choice. Um, <clears throat> depending if you get a. Uh, I mean, the other thing is the, the Escape, and the Escape is a seriously grown-up SUV. Right. The Escape, Quiet. it's a little hard at 20, 25 grand. You're going to have to get about 3,000 bucks off. But, yeah, yeah the Escape if you, is If you could nice. get one, and, and there, there are many incentives for, for Escapes already, yeah. but, um, but that is a vehicle that really does, it's kind of head and shoulders above right. some of the other ones yeah. in terms of quietness it's and very steering substantial. feel. And yeah. They also went and made some nice improvements to it uh, for 14. It, it has a power seat now in the SE level. It has a rear camera. So it, it's become a better yes. deal. It used it to be way, over, way overpriced. Right. They kind of like, they were a little stingy about equipment at first. They, they've caught back up. Yeah. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Our next episode, we're going to handle a bunch of questions and answers. So until then, thanks for listening.